I found certain aspects of Lean Startup to be hard in practice. I'm hoping to keep this a fairly interactive discussion, so don't hesitate to sort of just raise your hand at any point. Stop me if you have any questions. Um, so just really quickly about me, my nickname's RV, my full name's Arvind Krishnaswamy. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a tech executive. At this point, I'm a senior product manager with Intuit. I'm part of a discovery team at Intuit. Uh, discovery teams at Intuit are sort of similar to Google X. It's a strategic innovation unit where we use uh, lean startup and design thinking to go out and uncover new business on opportunities that Intuit might choose to pursue further. Uh, in the past, I've also been an entrepreneur. I've been a part of multiple startups. So I've sort of seen uh, lean both in the startup world as well as in the big company world. Whoops. Uh, can, can you hear now? Is that better? I have a deeper voice now, I think. So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, just do a quick recap really quickly. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a tech executive. The role that I'm currently in is with Intuit. Um, I'm part of a discovery team at Intuit. So the way discovery teams at Intuit are set up is uh, it's sort of like a strategic innovation team like Google X, and our charter is to go out and discover unmet uh, consumer needs, and to discover this through rapid experimentation, and then get it to a stage where it might grow into be a new viable op business opportunity for Intuit. Uh, in the past, I've also been a part of multiple startups, both here in India and in the Bay Area. One that went IPO on the NASDAQ, another that we had a great exit. Um, so I think I've sort of seen experimentation and different ways of building products, now both in the startup world as well as in a big company. And I'm hoping to sort of share some perspectives that bring both together. Um, so this is sort of the broad charter, sort of why is Lean Startup hard in practice? And I think I've, 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 I started practicing Lean Startup soon after I read the book. It's been a few years. From earlier in my career, where I think we went through more of a traditional way of how we went out building products, and I used to always sort of wonder, why did we build these things and spend so much time and money building things that no one cared about? I think Lean Startup has drastically changed just how I think about building products, and I think I've come a long way with it, but I think some things are still hard. Um, the objective here of this talk is I think I'm still learning too, you know, and I think the hope, uh, my hope is this is sort of open out conversations that we can all have about challenges we face as, this, or as these systems continue to evolve. Um, so uh, when I was a part of Levitum, which is the previous startup that I was a part of, um, uh, we, you know, one of the blog posts that I made about how we applied Lean Startup ended up on page one of Hacker News. And I think I had 20 to 30,000 people visiting me in one day to look at the blog posts and were contacting me. And it was sort of one of the frustrating parts where it applied it. We got to a point where we were invalidated, sort of frustrated, and we were like, oh, okay, we could still be happy that people are learning from uh, things that you've gone through. Um, here, I'm hoping to sort of bring some of those perspectives in. Uh, just from my personal journey, I have some perspectives of sort of where Lean Startup is at. I, and here's a slide that I think many of you would have seen. It's the classic hype cycle of any new, new technology or new things that come in. Technology triggers sort of go through a period of uh, inflated expectations, just significant hype around it. And then a throw of disillusionment where certain expectations weren't met and then arguably a slope of enlightenment and a plateau of productivity over time. And I personally believe that we've been going through a certain hype cycle with Lean Startup. And um, you know, there's a certain aspect of it which I think is very scientific. But along with that, I think there's a lot of pseudoscience, in my personal opinion, which is also sort of cropped up around Lean Startup. Uh, nothing against consultants and coaches, but I think just in the ecosystem overall, we've also seen a lot of consultants and coaches around Lean who have come up. I think a number of them are great, but I think a number of them who may be applying it, in my opinion, as a process versus a set of principles, sort of, to me, take away from sort of what the core of Lean Startup is as well. And I think it, it sort of affects our ability to apply some things. Um, I do sort of want to just quickly ask the audience, where do you guys think Lean Startup is at in this hype cycle? And uh, I've sort of marked out four areas. A, from the trigger to the peak, uh, the next is B, uh, C, the slope of enlight enlightenment, and then D, the plateau of productivity. So I'm just going to ask for a quick show of hands for those of you who feel that we're in phase A. Phase A. Okay, I see about six hands, great. Uh, how many feel we're in phase B? Three. Okay, I see about nine. How many think we're in phase C? 
Okay, skip with seven hands too. And at phase D. Okay, so no hands. Great, excellent. Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts. I don't, I mean, obviously, I think we all have different views about sort of where we are. <laughs> My personal opinion is I think we're sort of somewhere here as well in this territory. I feel that we've gone through a cycle where a few years back, lean was seen as a silver bullet to how we would go about doing things. A number of VCs took an in interest. Startups are trying to apply it. Big companies have been trying to apply it. I think we're at a point where I think we're all talking about challenges that we have with it. And part of this is to sort of open out maybe some conversations here. Um, now, I'm not here to sort of be too critical about lean, because I just think that ultimately, as every entrepreneur or an intrapreneur in a big company, I think we end up trying to juggle a lot of things. You know, we're expected to think big picture, but we've got to obsess, have obsessive compulsive disorder about all the little details of, you know, the product, experiments, uh, need to sort of align with uh, having a big top-down strategy, which would make sense for a VC or for an executive sponsor in a big company, while still thinking bottom-up with respect to experiments, right? Um, we want to be bold and fearless, but still have the humility to you know, know when to step aside, either alone or at a big company. Um, and I think most product managers, entrepreneurs you would talk with would, uh, would definitely tell you that there's a situational aspect to where you likely move between each of these, uh, being having customer insights, having to be data backed, uh, having bias towards reflection, which is still important, because um, action in itself is likely blind, but reflection alone is sort of important, right? You need a sort of a mix of both. Uh, focusing on learning, which arguably is more valuable, versus focusing on validation and focusing on shipping, because I think both are important since endless experimentation doesn't really take you anywhere, or experimenting for the sake of experimenting doesn't take you anywhere. Um, we need to have deep empathy for the customers for whom we're building the products and understand what their lives are like, but we also have to be stubborn since you just can't make everyone happy. Uh, we need to know what not to do and know what to do. Often what not to do, being clearer about it almost is more helpful in some ways since it makes some decisions simpler. And we need to have dogged persistence, either as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, to work through various challenges we face. But on the other hand, you know, we talk about also knowing when to pivot and having sort of a healthy detachment <laughs> from, for instance, the solution, but having a healthy attachment to the problem that we're going after. And uh, the reason I'm laying this out is I just think it's, it's still hard. And I think this is the reason why I struggle because I feel many people that I work with, I'm a part of a lean startup circle and a few groups who apply experimentation. I think it's so situational uh, that I think it's important to, for me to lay this out and say that it's, there's no easy answer necessarily. Um, so this, is, this slide is more around people who are getting into lean startup, uh, sort of an early stage of figuring out experimentation. Um, I think at an early stage, experiment design is still hard, you know, uh, to, to outline what the vision that you have is, to figure out, to develop a business model canvas, to have a rigorous approach to identifying what your high risk assumptions are, identifying your leap of faith, and then crafting an experiment that fought with a falsifiable hyp hypothesis around it uh, takes a fair amount of discipline and some experience. I personally, when I look back at experiments that I ran maybe three years back, <laughs> I feel embarrassed because I think I could have done something so differently. And I'll share some examples as we go along. Uh, I, I think many of you might have seen this as a shared on Twitter. Uh, I don't know if you guys can read this. I realize the font is a little small. But uh, this is an experiment someone ran for minimal viable pizza. So hypothesis, can we sell pizza for profit? Time to produce a pizza, four minutes. Cost, let's say it's like as cheap as possible, right? And the learning at the end of this, after having delivered a fairly burnt pizza, is there's no demand for pizza. So uh, I, this is sort of shared in enough examples of sort of challenges with taking a scrappy approach or, or taking an approach where you go too minimal uh, with an experiment. Uh, now, part of my question for you is, if you were to think about this, how would you rework this experiment? An experiment for minimal viable pizza. Okay. Okay, sure. sure. Get feedback from customers. 
Okay. 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 Sure. Yeah. So I think part of their part of the hypothesis they have here is sort of low cost pizza and and, and really like you know like in four minutes. Yeah. 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 So what is it? Yeah. The burnt pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So in this example, what could it be? <laughs> Minimal eatable pizza. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts? So, but, but, but you see the point that I'm going with here, right? Part of it is sometimes I feel that we run experiments and we say that we're invalidated, but... Minimal marketable, okay? Which can be bought, but doesn't have to be eaten. Okay, great. Good, good points. Um, one thing I want to point out is, uh, part of the reason I wanted to share this example is I've seen people, and myself included in some situations, where we have run an experiment, uh, we have the result, but we're left feeling, was I invalidated, was I validated? And um, one thing with Lean Startup is it talk, we, we talk about how you need to ensure that your experiment is falsifiable. So what we refer to with this is, uh, let's say you run a landing page, like the example he spoke about. And we say that the criteria for this is, um, we're running Google Ads, people look at it and come and click through and come in. Uh, so we're targeting keywords like Domino's and Pizza Hut. And our success criteria is that uh, 10 out of 100 people who visit will sign up for pizza. So this typically sounds good, right? But often one of the challenges that comes through with this is it's not always easily falsifiable. So what I mean by this is if you had said 10 out of 100, it's good, right? Uh, what if nine came through? What would you do? <laughs> That's one way. <laughs> So uh, one part that I think is useful to be clear about is sort of what that minimum number is, right? And tied to that is what are you really looking to learn? Because ultimately every experiment is out there to help you with learning and is really to help you answer a certain question. Right? So, it, it, you know, if you're, sorry, go ahead. Correct, so, so to go back to the experiment, it's important to first focus on what are we trying to learn. Uh, if all we're trying to see is, is there demand for cheap, quick pizza? All we're trying to do is demand. Ignore the fact that the pizza is burnt. Ignore the fact that no one's gonna eat it. Set that aside for now and focus on what your learning really is. So part of the reason I'm trying to address this is a bit of a misconception. Because it's easy to look at an example and think, oh, experimentation doesn't really work out. The only way is you've got to build the whole pizza and do it. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It's okay to do something that's very scrappy and minimal and burnt if all that you were looking to see is, are people interested in cheap, quick pizza? Because your next experiment may be to say, hey, okay, now how do we deliver something better that still fits here? And you run another experiment. So an example of the website is that your initial website might be really scrappy and not that great. But you may have a subsequent experiment which says, uh, by improving the design of the site, my conversion rate would improve by 
And you could do that downstream. You don't need to, for instance, with mobile apps, right? One of the common challenges is typically the fidelity bar that Apple has set is so high. So people expect a fantastic experience, which makes it hard if you go with a hybrid app with PhoneGap or you know, one of those uh, HTML5 based apps, since people aren't happy with the experience. So often the case that a lot of people make is you have no option but to go big bang. So you need to go for a big app store launch, make sure you end up in one of the top lists, and that's the best way for you to get discoverability and distribution. But on the contrary, if you come back to sort of what are you really trying to learn, you don't need to go out and do that. It's important to say, look, this is just an experiment. This is what I'm looking to learn, and then start with that, and then go forward. Yeah, great question, man. Uh, so definitely ensuring that whatever is falsifiable is put down is really important. Like success could mean 15%, 20%, 30%, 30%, right? You can have a disagreement on that. But really the business decision or uh, you know, uh, an entrepreneurial decision you're trying to make is should I continue down this path at all? And for that you want to say, look, if I don't have one paid customer by the end of this month, I'm not going to move forward. You've got to be very, very clear about that. So that is a falsifiable side effect of ensuring if this doesn't happen, then my fundamental hypothesis around this business or this opportunity I'm trying to pursue is false. You know? um, so it, it, it's so part of, I think this very fundamental starting point challenge with Lean Startup is I think some of this is not exactly straightforward is what I've seen. It took me a while to sort of tune how I think about it. Um, and I've found that the best way to go about it is to talk to more people and exchange notes a little bit uh, to understand this. Um, I have another example here. I think the font may not be great, but um, this is an experiment which one of the teams I was working with earlier tried to run. Um, so sort of the opportunity they were trying to look at is digital marketers who are trying to maintain a presence on social media. And many of them, what they try to do is they go out and try to find a lot of digital content and then set it up with tools like Buffer and others so that they keep publishing them. So they keep looking for uh, content that they can publish. So part of the, the idea here is, hey, you know, we build something to which would auto-tweet on their behalf and find interesting content for them, they would be interested in it. Um, so uh, this is a concierge experiment, which I think for those of you who are familiar, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, there's no technology behind it. Someone does it manually, pretending as though there is technology. Um, so this is a concierge experiment which someone has uh, attempted to run, right? Uh, saying they'll get a bunch of people to sign up and say they'll auto-tweet on their behalf and we've got these algorithms which will curate content and do it for you, right? But in reality, there's no algorithm. There's just a few people doing it manually behind the scenes, right? And um, going through questions with people to get them to sign up, uh, running through a concierge service for two weeks, and then at the end of two weeks, running a disappointment survey to see whether uh, look, if I stop the service now, how disappointed would you be, right? Fairly typical uh, approach that many people would take to uh, running an experiment like this. Um, now, if you look at this experiment, right, this sort of has one of the same challenges I mentioned, which is overall it looks like a fair approach, right? It's got concierge, you're gonna run it, you're not putting in much effort, someone does it manually, you're doing things that don't scale to start with and focus about scalability later, but it's not clear what success is, right? It's not clear uh, from this experiment whether how you would decide what is validation and what is not. Now the other thing to think about too is, is this really the highest risk aspect? Now one of the uh, important things is before you start off experimenting, to think of what your leap of faith assumption is, which is the most high risk assumption that you're making in whatever you're going down, right? And it's not always easy to identify what that is, and at times, the other challenge that I've at least had with Lean Startup is sometimes to test your high-risk assumption, you need to sort of either build out a little more or validate other assumptions first. The most common one is often a channel hypothesis which you sort of need to validate before you can go on to test a problem hypothesis or go on to look at other aspects. Um, the second challenge that I've had is whenever you're building a network effects platform, uh, you know, you can find ways of working around the chicken and egg problem, often by either subsidizing one side or thinking of one side as being the user, if you will. 
But uh, often what I found is with those platforms, you have to seed them. Either having to seed them or getting to a certain stage of a community that's involved. Uh, I've, I've found that without it, it's a little hard to run experiments. I would love to hear if some of you have run experiments with platform products to see how you've gone about it, uh, how you've chosen which categories to go after, and how you've sort of thought about it. I've sort of found this part a little hard. Um, so I think the next one is around just managing control variables uh, across multiple experiment batches. So often what would happen is, right, you would run multiple experiments, uh, one after another, uh, trying them at different groups to test different things. Now, you know, we can, you know, I'd like to think that Lean Startup makes us more scientific and <laughs> more intelligent with how we're doing things. But experiments in science are run in controlled environments, right? Where things are carefully controlled and managed. Now, how do we manage that in the real world? Any of you here who are running experiments have any thoughts on this? I mean, as an entrepreneur running a landing page experiment, there's seasonality, there's so many other things that get involved. I'm just curious, I mean, how do you usually approach this? Any thoughts? Cool. Uh, sure. It depends though, right? Yeah, yeah, correct, around what and, at, yeah, okay. Short in the duration, sure, so you got Yeah. Yeah, yeah, got it. Got it, so you're saying, uh, correct. Correct, correct, yeah. Right, so let's say you go to three different campuses. Now, one of them is, uh, it's a ladies college, another one is a PU, another one is an IIT. And you end up having very different results from the three. How do you interpret them? Yeah, correct and get back, right? So at least for me, at least the struggle I personally had is, uh, so this is something I've done at Intuit, I've blanked out some parts, but within Intuit, within a small business uh, business unit, uh, this is an experiment we were running around trying to look at people's interest in QuickBooks reports, okay? And um, one thing we tried was to try to get a little better at identifying what we thought the control variables were. So one example was personas of the users who were involved. Another one was identifying like, the other thing that's going to vary is the incentive that we would offer them. So I can't say this helped a whole lot, <laughs> but uh, we tried to identify what some of these variables are across experiments and try to manage them like you would in a scientific experiment as control variables. Because otherwise, Without it, right, you, uh, we end up sort of at the same point of, look, are we doing an apples to apples comparison? Are we really validated or invalidated here? And finding that a little harder. So at least I think identifying control variables across experiment batches, I found this to be uh, helpful. Uh, so this is another one which I think both, uh, both uh, someone inside a startup and a large company faces, which is if you're running an experiment, you want your sampling size to be enough to hold some statistical significance. Um, I think different people have opinions on this. Um, I'll, I'll walk through a couple of slides and, and talk about this point a little more and why it's important. Uh, I think for those who have seen the old dinosaur slides, this might be familiar. But uh, you know, you can go out, you can run a landing page experiment and eight out of 100 visitors sign up. Now, what happens is, is eight out of 100 good enough? Uh, do you have benchmarks for the sort of ads that you're running, for the things that you're doing? Uh, do you have organizational benchmarks on email open rates that are dependable for your industry? Uh, so if you're mailing a bunch of accountants, for instance, 
do you know what a typical open rate for those emails would be? Can you benchmark against it? If not, how do you decide, right? And next, is 100 interesting enough that you would seek validation and go on to a broader sampling size from there? Um, so one thing I want to touch upon is, you know, ultimately there are many different approaches to how you design your MVP. I mean, these are some of them. People use other approaches too. Uh, and all of them have different levels of fidelity. And obviously, you, you know, you, depending on what you want to learn, you may choose something that has lower fidelity and then move on from there to something that has a higher level of fidelity. Um, so for instance, one well-known one is, oops, okay, is imposter judo, which is a, uh, if you're trying to build a mobile app, uh, see if you've got a competitive app out there and go show that to some potential target users who don't know the app and see what they think about it and try to learn. <laughs> so learn from what your competitors already have or other people in the market already have and try to learn. So that is like literally zero effort, right, in certain ways. But uh, it's at a lower level of fidelity. Now the thing is, as you move into an experiment at a higher level of fidelity, for instance, maybe a concierge, where you're manually offering a certain service, you're still at the point where you need to decide, okay, now you've handled a concierge experiment where 1,000 people have come through. And here is what you're seeing, right? Um, I think with entrepreneurs, often, like marketing budgets may be limited. You can only test with so many users. Uh, in a big company, uh, you know, companies can be a little protective about their existing user base and existing product lines and sensitive to it. So even there, you know, your ability to get to a large user base at the start may be hard. And you may still need to work through legal and privacy to ensure that you can test what you want to. There is a bit of that balance. I'm sure entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, you would relate to this. Um, so part of it is sort of this tough question of what constitutes validation and when do you decide to double down? So either as a startup or you know, and, and, you know, if, you're in a, if you're running an incubator inside a big company that's practicing lean startup, how do you decide when to double down on an idea that you think one of your teams has made enough progress on? And I think I've still struggled a little bit with this. I, I don't think the answers are still completely clear. I'd love to get inputs. Um, I think the next thing to me is misunderstanding complex versus complicated systems. Are any of you here who attended last year's Agile India? Anyone? Okay, handful. So there's this great session on uh, the Kinevin framework, which uh, D D uh, Snowden, uh, we had a keynote last year, and uh, he spoke about uh, thinking of complex systems and how complex systems can be classified into, you know, depending on the state they're in, simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. Um, I won't go into it in a whole lot of detail. Um, in, in a, the most simple way to think about it is in a, in a very simple system, the relationship between cause and effect is obvious to all, right? So, uh, if you you know if all you're doing is um, you you know for instance you've got the uh, reception desk right here at Agile India, you could work off best practices because everyone knows what has to be done. It's a relatively simpler system, uh, and uh, what has to be done is fairly obvious to all. From here, you sort of go on to more complicated systems um, where Cause and effect requires analysis or investigation, right? And then there's a system, the space which he calls complex, where cause and effect can only be perceived in retrospect. Okay, so cause and effect can only be perceived in retrospect. And finally, uh, chaotic systems, where there's no obvious relationship, and the only way you can go about things is sort of acting, sensing, and responding. Um, I'll focus just a little bit here uh, there's no relationship at all in whatsoever between uh, Kinevin and Lean Startup, directly in any way whatsoever. Uh, I think the objective of Kinevin is very different, but I found it useful to think about this in the context of Lean Startup, especially since uh, while crafting experiments, uh, I found it useful to think about what are we really trying to learn, and in certain cases, um, uh, what we're looking to learn uh, may be in a space that is not complex. It may be complicated, but not complex. And if it is complicated, but not complex, it may not need experimentation, you know? Um, and the other aspect of this that I've found is um, um, for people who may come from more of a business school background or from a more uh, uh, sort of cause and effect analysis approach to saying, why are we doing what we're doing, right? Because it's an important question. Uh, there are a lot of situations where when you're going into a new space, you're introducing a new product or you're trying to drastically change things, 
it may not be, it, it's just hard to predict how users would respond. So we, you may have some theories, but the only way it sometimes is to run little light experiments, right? A number of rapid experiments and test it out, okay? Um, so where this gets a little tricky is uh, when it is com complicated but not complex, I feel that you can take that approach where you could um, craft experiments where you have a clear hypothesis about how a user will behave and why they will behave that way. Right? And you can go out to test whether the user behaves that way and then later follow up with customer development interviews to understand why they behave that way. Um, but at least the complex systems, I think it's harder. So it may, not, it may not be obvious why someone will behave that way. We may just not know at all. But we just have to try a number of experiments and then maybe later we will understand. And I thought this thinking was useful for me. Uh, I want to say though, though, this is not, you know, I think this is still, it's, it's important to say that there are, you know, uh, one approach that some entrepreneurs would take is to try a number of different things <laughs> and then to see what sticks. And that works for a number of entrepreneurs. Uh, now, I'm not necessarily saying that, that this is the approach which I'm endorsing. Uh, so I think maybe there's still a certain uh, deliberate approach to planning experiments, but uh, maybe uh, greater flexibility with sort of trying a lot of things in parallel and then seeing what sticks, but with a certain method to it. But not necessarily a mode where you will only experiment and only after validation go on to try something else. I found it useful to try more things in parallel. Uh, so this is just my learning and perspective on this. Um, now one of the other common things that people talk about is just sort of the risk of uh, getting stuck at a local you know, maxima and missing a bigger opportunity when you take up a lean startup approach. Um, here's at least one thing we do at Intuit. Uh, these tools are available on Intuit Labs uh, website in case any of you want to look at it. It's a free download on Intuit Labs. Um, it's an approach of sort of going broad before you go narrow. So part of the risk is this, right? The lean startup, uh, uh, in my opinion, you know, you can, you can, uh, you, you start off with a vision, you've identified a problem, and then you start, you have an idea for a solution, and you start to iterate towards it. Uh, I think often as entrepreneurs, and I think it's just human bias, once you go down a certain path with a solution, uh, the willingness to sort of step back and try other things once you've gone down a certain path is a little lower. So, uh, and once you start experimenting, you're so down in the weeds that it's a little hard to step away. So one thing that, uh, it's a little exercise we go through at Intuit Labs, is to sort of go broad and try to develop at least seven solutions, no matter how wacky they are, for the problem we're trying to go after. And then after we've identified those seven, you put them down in a two by two, okay? And uh, the axis of the two by two sort of depend on what you're looking at but you put down two by two to sort of decide which of these solutions you would then pursue further. Uh, the next one uh, is about uh, effectuation. Uh, anybody here who's familiar with effectuation? Uh, okay, I'll quickly talk about this. Um, so there's one school of thought led by Professor Saras Saraswati. Uh, she's written about it after having studied a number of entrepreneurs and how they think about building startups where she talks about the difference between what she calls causal reasoning and effectual reasoning. Okay, and here's a slide that talks about the two. Okay. Um, and this is important, and I think this is also a source of one of the aspects of criticism of Lean Startup, where uh, a lot of people would tell you that uh, a lot of the success stories of Lean Startup came after those companies had succeeded. And it's easy to look at some of these things after the fact and say, oh yeah, yeah this is a success because of that but who are the people who are succeeding while applying it? And you can make the argument on the other side talking about how many companies have failed faster by applying Lean Startup and therefore save millions and millions of dollars by not going down a path that they would otherwise have gone down, right? But on the other hand, I think the important point here is causal reasoning, right? Managerial thinking of um, here's our vision, here's where we want to get to, and how do we get there? Right? And here are all the different steps towards getting there versus entrepreneurial thinking, which is here are all the things that I have today. Here are the resources at my disposal today. Using these things at my disposal, what can I do? 
So part of the effectuation thesis is that how most entrepreneurs think is they start with what they have. What are the resources at my hand? Who are the people I can leverage? Who are the connections that I have? How can I build something from here to go somewhere? So they may have an idea of where they want to go, but it's not necessarily completely fixed. Causal reasoning, in large ways, attempts to predict the future. Right? It attempts to predict what is happening. Effectual reasoning pretty much says, you're not going to be able to predict the future. What do you know? What do you have? How can you start with that as an entrepreneur and then go from there with your given means towards many possible imagined ends? Some may work out, some may not work out. And figuring out how you move towards that. So to me, uh, where I think uh, there are times that I've struggled a little bit with this and I see some people struggle is inherently, I think certain aspects of what we do is causal, but there's an effectual side to how we all think as well. Uh, I think here in India, you would talk a lot of small town entrepreneurs whom I would argue, think about what they have and then they try to figure out what they can do. They may not necessarily start with a big, broad vision. Now, the interesting thing, though, is it doesn't just apply to smaller entrepreneurs, mom and, mom and uh, pop shops. Uh, her studies included Steve Jobs. It included very successful value entrepreneurs that she surveyed, and she, she found that uh, this is the approach that they take. Now, the hard part with effectuation or any of these frameworks is these are, they're all tools. It's, it's hard to... Uh, and we, can, we can sort of make cases saying one may benefit you more than the other. Uh, I think of these as tools, and it's good to sort of think about uh, the relevance to what we're trying to apply it to. Uh, but I think just in our minds for entrepreneurs, I feel that this is one area where I found a bit of a disconnect. And I'm sort of at a point now where I see that lean startup is being applied more at big companies than at startups. <laughs> and I've sort of asked, tried to ask myself, why? <laughs> Is it because entrepreneurs are more, cause, are more effectual in how they think? Is it because uh, business leaders at big companies are more causal in how they think? Is that a fundamental difference? Uh, MBA graduates who are tuned towards managing risk, managing a business that's at peacetime, versus entrepreneurs who are natural wartime leaders who are out to go out and build things from scratch and find their way through you know, different things. Uh, so I think this is the broad uh, list. Again, I, I, uh, to be clear, I mean, I, I think Lean Startup is fabulous. It's made a huge difference to how I think about product, how I think about building it. Uh, I've also struggled with some of this. Uh, I'm still learning. <laughs> I think we all are. Uh, I think we're more scientific about how we build products today than we ever were before. Uh, I'm hoping that some of these uh, are areas where I'm hoping to learn more from all of you here and uh, hopefully we can trade notes, because part of the objective of coming forward to events like this is to also open out just conversations on some of these topics. So I think that's all I had, and we can open it up to questions. And here are my coordinates. If any of you need help with a new idea or or looking for uh, speaker sessions at your company or talks, happy to come by, help, uh, exchange ideas, and uh, looking to see what we can do to have more conversations about Lean Startup locally here and in our ecosystem. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, Intuit is an 8,000-person company that thinks of itself as an 8,000-person startup. And uh, if you've read the Lean Startup book, Intuit is uh, featured in one of the chapters with examples of snap tax. Uh, so Intuit uses Lean Startup actively within uh, the company to run experiments at various sizes in the different areas of the company. We have definitely seen people come forward uh, it could be, so typically like a discovery team that gets created is a combination of a product manager, an engineer, and an interaction designer. And great ideas can come from anywhere. And part of these systems of enabling people in their time to experiment also sort of lets you get away from managers in the company playing Caesar, right? Because they may not be the best place to understand what is involved and to empower the employees to give them the space and a framework to think about this and run experiments, and to help decide uh, 
based on what criteria you would say that you have succeeded at one step and you would go from this step to the next. So for instance, one way at Intuit that we think about it is your first step is to find one customer who wants what you're trying to build. Find one and make that one customer happy. And then track what we call love metrics to have a minimal lovable product, love metrics, for that one customer. And once you've done it for one, you find a cohort of users that you want to go to from there and take it to that cohort. And then from there, sort of problem solution fit and then finally product market fit. Um, let's say we've had a, you know, I think it's, I think definitely number of ideas and innovations have come through it into it, which have emerged through this. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So, um, so definitely, sort of the top-down strategy approach is something that still most companies, and I think Intuit, you know, approaches some things this way as well. Um, and ultimately, different things succeed in different organizations, right? Um, now, given your question, sort of the approach, what would you maybe take? To me, maybe thinking about the plan and trying to understand what they're the most worried about. You know, what is the most high risk, what is the high risk hypothesis here? Are they worried about monetization? Are they worried about whether the problem really exists? Are they worried about uh, being able to, uh, are they worried about having a unique uh, proposition? About having a durable advantage and building a moat? Uh, sort of understanding what do they think is the most high risk assumption? Uh, in case it's an organization that's not yet familiar with lean and experimentation, potentially trying to see if you can run a skunk's work team that would take uh, the most high risk hypothesis and run some experiments to test it, and then come back and share the learnings. Because ultimately here, the biggest part about it is uh, to see it as a tool that enables learning, rapid learning. So more than validation, which is to show that, oh, it's a good idea, it's a bad idea. I think the learning is a bigger, more important objective. And showing that this is a framework which can enable that learning quickly, I think is a, could be persuasive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, Yeah, I think maybe we can discuss the fix offline. <laughs> at various companies too. Uh, but if we do believe, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll talk to you offline and maybe we can discuss some ideas. Any other questions? Sure, please. Uh, so as discovery teams within Intuit, uh, we initially go broad. And we start off by trying to come up with the biggest, broadest ideas that we can. And then we try to go narrow. Uh, when we go narrow, we do look at it at the lens of what Intuit's mission is uh, overall and how it aligns with that mission. And those are some criteria based on which we decide which ones we would go after. So, yeah. Yeah. 
at, at a certain, once they get to a certain stage, uh, they would need to, absolutely. Uh, idea, so technology, so typically uh, with experimentation, uh, most often the objective is to test it with test customer behavior. So if customer does this, then we would do this. So uh, it, with typically with, with uh, tech exploration, you would want to still start with uh, a customer benefit that you want to test. Identify that there is a customer benefit, validate that need, and then from there come back to say, okay, so here is a technology exploration that we want to do in order to deliver this benefit this way. Does it make sense? Sure, thanks. Sure, okay. Sure, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's say your idea goes to the market and then you have competition. So, uh, so, if, yeah, yeah. So I think the idea was, uh, look, you spend all this time experimenting, and then by the time you take your idea to the market, someone else comes out with it, and you, right? yeah, yeah. So um, I think there's a few things. Uh, so remember, one of the most important parts is uh, identifying what your most high risk uh, assumption or hypothesis is. So in this case most likely your highest risk was that someone could, would copycat you really easily, right? So for instance, you can take the example of Groupon, right, which had a great launch and you know it, it really got a lot of people excited, but then people realized that one, they weren't necessarily making money or the economics didn't make sense, and two, enough copycats came along. So then the question is really with what, sure, you have a problem that you've found, you have a solution that you've been able to deliver, but do you have an enduring advantage? Do you have a durable advantage? What's your secret? Uh, I guess Peter Thiel asks in his zero to one book or what people's secret is, but identifying that secret becomes really important. So it's important to you know, ensure that you're going after a large problem, one that you know you can solve, but also one where you would have an advantage of some sort over someone else who would come in either now or in the future. So. That's when you'd want to think about what those defensible abilities are, is it patents, are there network effects that you could create, and those start to become important. In general, I would say that you know, this, the, the period of stealth mode startups is gone, right? Just being able to talk about your idea and being comfortable talking about your idea will save you a ton of time, get you much more input, and get you to you know, a stage where you learn a lot sooner. So uh, I would definitely not worry too much about competitors, and at the early stage and try to focus on the problem you're trying to solve. So. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm around at lunch if you have any other questions. Hope it's finished. Thank you.